we're back out here at the Big Lake once again. And today we're talking about my proven technique for locating and catching those stubborn winter bass. Stick around, you don't want to miss this one. Got him. Ooh, that's a nice one. Come on now, ooh, that one feels pretty okay. And here is this video's featured comment. Congratulations! If you would like to have a chance to have your comment featured in an upcoming video, all you've got to do is leave a comment. And now, on with the video. Welcome back to Lowbrow Fishing. And in the last couple of videos, we've done some deep dives into jerk baits and spinner baits. We talked about the various types of jerk baits, the various types of spinner baits, how, when, where, and why to use each one. And I've had a couple of people ask me, you know, lowbrow, how do you know? How do you know which situation is which and what bait to best use for that situation? Why do you use those things the way that you do? So that got me thinking, perhaps we need to do a bit of a deep dive on how I'm breaking down the water especially in winter, you know, those bass can be really hard to find. And once you do find them, they may not be in a mood to bite. So we really have to wrestle with it sometimes, you know. But the good thing about winter is, is now that the deep freeze has really set in for most of the country, those bass are in winter mode. They're not going to roam nearly as much. Now, caveat there, that doesn't mean they're not going to roam at all. It just means that they're not going to be moving all over the lake like they were. If they're in the back of a pocket, well, they may roam around the back of that pocket. But for the most part, that's where they're going to be the entire winter. You know, that's how it works on Mississippi lakes. That's how it works on Alabama lakes and in Georgia lakes and in Louisiana lakes and Texas lakes. And all the lakes that I've been to, once those fish find a home for the winter, that's pretty much where they are, whether it's shallow, whether it's deep, that's where those fish are going to be until the pre-spawn, until they start to wake up for the spring. So we can use that to our advantage. We can use that to help us locate those fish each and every time we go out. But in order to break down the lake, I need to break it up into sections. And it's not as complicated as it sounds. I'm generally breaking the lake up into three different sections. Zone one, zone two, zone three. It's that simple, right? Zone one, that's out deep. You say, well, lowbrow, what's out deep? Well, for me, out deep generally has two characteristics, right? As all the zones do. The distance from the bank and the depth of the water. Generally, we're looking at about a three, four, you know, cast lengths off of the bank. That's generally in these waters out here where that water gets to be in that 15 to 20 feet range and then even off deeper up into about 30 feet in a couple of spots on this lake. Granted, the big lake is not very deep, especially compared to some mountain lakes, which can get 150, 200 foot deep. This is nothing, but this is still portable. This will still plug and play on every single fishery that you'll come across in the United States. This works everywhere you go. So offshore, we're saying three or four cast lengths from the bank. So zone one, offshore, deep, we're going to call that three or four cast lengths from the bank. And the sad thing about it is, is this is going to be the one zone where bank anglers, where you're not going to be able to get to for the most part. Now, if you're fishing near a bluff wall or something that's got a deep incline, right, a 45 degree bank, something that gets off and gets deep quickly, well, then that's different. You'll be able to access some deeper waters and you'll be able to fish some of these techniques. But for the most part, this is going to be out of the range of bank anglers. And there is going to be a population of fish that head offshore and head deep in the wintertime. And there's going to be some big fish in there. But what am I fishing? How am I attacking that? Well, a lot of times it's going to be bigger, heavier baits. Although not always, if I can get away with fishing something like this Berkeley bad shad, you know, this thing gets down to about eight feet and I can fish that 10 to 15 foot water with this, especially if I'm coming over 
you know, the specific structure that is out deep. Because out deep, we're going to have different types of cover. We're going to have different types of structure. We're going to have submerged brush piles and maybe some standing timber, maybe some laydowns, maybe some rock piles. You know, out deep has its own characteristics. It's got its own types of cover and structure, and we need to fish it that way. So something like this, if I want to come over the top of that structure, if I want to come up over the top of that brush pile or the top of that, you know, standing timber or the rock pile, something like this will work perfectly fine. I'm not going to be getting all the way down there because this, you know, depending on the gear that I'm using, if I use this on a spinning reel and I've only got about eight to 10 pound test, you know, fluorocarbon, I can get this down close to that 10 foot range, but that's going to be pushing it. But even then I can still come over that structure, come over that cover that's down there and, you know, hopefully call some of those bass out, especially if I'm slow rolling it a bit, which because this is a build crankbait, I can do that. I can basically still get it down there and keep it down there because it's a crankbait to build crankbait, right? And I can just slow roll it over that structure. Now, another thing that I'm going to be doing is going to be, well, a big old heavy football jig, right? A half ounce, a three quarter ounce, a one ounce football jig, something that's going to keep that bait near or on the bottom. I might be hopping it, I might be dragging it, but when those deep fish, when those offshore fish are going to be on the bottom when they've got their bellies in the mud, just like all fish tend to do from time to time, I can use this to get all the way down there and stay all the way down there. And again, you know, even in the winter time, I'm going to be dragging a jig. This is going to be one of the most versatile year round tools that you have. You can use them in the spring, summer, winter, and fall. And right now they're just as good as they are any other time of year. So, you know, a football jig, if you're not a jig fisherman, this is a good time to practice. This is a good time to throw one out there, let it sink down and just slow drag it along. And you can get quite a few quality bites. Now, I'm still trying to pare down that presentation. As you can see, you know, I've only got a small, short little trailer on this thing. And I'm trying to keep that presentation as compact as I possibly can, even in the wintertime, even though I'm throwing a heavier jig. So, you know, but again, even something like a jerkbait, although I'm pulling out my bigger jerkbaits. This is a Smithwick Perfect 10. It looks a lot like a Rattlin Rogue. It's essentially the same body style, but this is much, much bigger. This will get down to 10 or 12 feet or more, and it suspends. So I can get this way down there where those big fish are at and put this in front of their face. I'm not going to get a whole lot of bites on this during the day. This is not a numbers game, but I can still get some really nice size whenever I can get those bigger girls, those six, seven pound bass who are just looking for an easy meal, something right in front of their face. And I can get this down there to them. I can get it to suspend in the water and I can get a couple of really good bites a day, a couple of really good strikes on this bait. You know, once I find the deep areas where those fish are at, and that's going to take a little bit of leg work or boat work. You're going to have to find where that cover is. You're going to have to find where that structure is. But once you do, like I said, that deeper water, you can fish it with those deeper baits and still slow roll it across and keep those fish interested. Now, next up, we're going to talk about zone two, which, as you've heard me say, is the intermediate water. Now, for the intermediate water, you actually have the most wiggle room. This is where you can do the most because we have some overlap. Some deep water techniques are going to work. Some shallow water techniques are going to work. So you can kind of use both things. Now, what's going to be one of the biggest things that I'm going to start off with? Well, something like this spy bait, you know. I can work this spy bait in that 10, 15 foot range, you know. And that's going to be about what I'm looking for is intermediate from anywhere, let's say 8 foot, you know, 8 foot to 15 foot from about two cast lengths off of the shore. Now we're starting to get on the edge where bank anglers can actually reach. So these are things that bank anglers can actually do, especially if you've got the wind at your back and you can make those longer casts. Something like this spy bait, you know, will work really good. I can work this down in about seven or eight feet of water, maybe a little bit, 
maybe a little bit deeper, you know, depending upon the conditions, depending upon how that wind is, the line that I have, and the mood that those fish are in, I might be able to call some up from a little bit deeper. And another thing that's going to work pretty well is going to be a swim bait. You see, I've got a low brow rig here because in my lake, well, in that intermediate area, that's where that vegetation is going to start to come in. That's where you're going to see those hard hydrilla lines. And I love running a swim bait or a swim jig along those seams. For me, that's going to be where those bites are going to be the most plentiful during the winter time. That's where I like to focus most of my attention is going to be in that intermediate water. And that's where I'm going to be throwing something like a lowbrow rig or a swim jig or a jerk bait. This is where your standard jerk bait is really going to shine in that intermediate depth. And again, two cast lengths off of the shore, we're looking at different types of cover. In that intermediate depth, you're going to have everything. All bets are off. You're going to have vegetation. You're going to have laydowns. You're going to have rock piles. You might even have some standing timber and some stumps and whatnot that will really affect how you can fish. This is going to be the most complex area. And most of the time in the winter, this is where I'm focusing on most of my fishing. Like I said, you're looking at about two cast lengths, depending on, you know, the depth of the water and how far out you want to go. Something like this standard suspending Yozuri jerkbait will work exceptionally well. You know, various sizes, various types. A rising jerkbait will work, especially if you've got some vegetation, some, you know, some brush piles that you want to stay above, you want to have be able to back out of and they float. You know, that will work well. You can even work a, a crankbait, right? Like this, this is a classical leader from Lucky Craft. You know, it's a great little bait. This one gets down to about eight or 10 feet. And I can use this to actually get down and grind into that bottom right there when I want to do that. Now, I'm not doing that so much in the winter time. I'll use this a little bit further off if I want some flash, if we've got some wind, but I can still run this along those seams. I can still run this along those weed edges or those brush pile edges, and we can have quite a bit of success doing it that way. Now, lastly, well, we're going to talk about zone three. That's obviously right up near the bank. And this one's going to be where you, most of your bank anglers are going to spend most of their time. They're going to be beating the bank. And it's funny because you'll see a lot of boat anglers, well, they've got this expensive boat, and yet they spend their entire day crowding the bank. And the reason they're doing that, there's fish there. There are plenty of fish to catch in the wintertime. We've got bluebird skies. It's really sunny. So those fish are going to tend to be a good bit more active on a day like today when they can absorb that sunlight and they can get a little bit more energy. You know, what am I using? Well, I'm going to be using something like this good old Waco rig here. You know, uh, a Texas rigged worm will work exceptionally well. Something like a 1 8 ounce bullet weight will get you where you want to go. Something like a soft plastic jerk bait on a 4 aught or 5 aught heavy wire EWG, that will work great for you in that shallower area. You can work that entire area up to down, you know, top to bottom, back to front with a bait like that. You can use a small jig. This right here, this is a small one quarter ounce Bitsy Flip, you know, a quarter ounce jig, a little finesse jig. Again, you can work that water column top to bottom so much easier next to the bank. And, you know, there's a lot of forgiveness. There's a lot of leeway when it comes to the bank because you have such skinny water. You can use something like this, this little Rebel Minnow, right? These work great from the bank. You don't necessarily have to get all the way down. You can still, you know, be near the top of the water column and keep those fish interested because they don't have very far to go. In some areas of the country, you know, people are still using something like a topwater, like a Zara Spook or even a wake bait, and they're having great amounts of success using those different types of things. So you have to think about when you're fishing the lake, you've got to think about different areas, different zones. And when you get out to those areas, when you get out to those zones, you have to attack each one, not just based on the conditions, but based on where they are at in the water column because each one has its own challenges. Each one's going to have its own type of cover. Each one's going to have its own type of structure. And the fish are going to be relating and setting up differently. 
And once you figure that out, once you get those pieces of the puzzle put together, you'll not only find bass so much more quickly, but you'll catch those bass once you learn how to attack each zone, each type of area differently, you know, using the tools at your disposal. And the more you do it, the more confidence you will build when doing it. And hopefully you'll be able to diversify your angling and that's really the key that we're trying to do here. But there are times when we need to branch out to change what it is we're doing. You know, we can always get one, maybe two bites or whatever, doing a Ned rig or a Texas rig or something like that. But we want to be able to adjust on the fly to change our patterns as we're going along so that we catch more fish because that's what it boils down to, right? We love fishing, but it's even more fun catching. So there you have it. Those are my secret tricks for breaking down the lake. I divide things up into chunks and then I look for the differences inside each one. And then I use the baits and lures that I have to attack each one accordingly. It really helps me to locate bass and to catch more bass. Thanks for watching Lowbrow Fishing. We'll catch you in the next one.